So, uh, thank you for coming. It's great to be with you in uh, balmy Minneapolis. <laughs> um, I, I, th I think I, I would start by just giving you uh, a, a little bit of um, personal information just so that you would kind of have a sense of like, like full disclosure, like who you're dealing with tonight. Um, so I'm, uh, I grew up in Ohio. Um, I'm a Buckeye fan. Um, I have been uh, married for 32 years. Uh, we have a daughter who's 28 and a son who's 25. And I um, make a living as a psychiatrist working in Washington, D.C., where I will never be out of a job. <laughs> That's not really funny. It's right there. It's the truth. Um, and so we're here tonight to talk about um, a number of different intersecting questions. And we want this to be a, an opportunity for a conversation. I hope that that's where we um, uh, land eventually. And uh, so let me, let me begin with just some reflections about what my understanding is of what I do. And um, after we finish that, we'll go to Q&A time and have a chance for you all to enter into that conversation. So the first thing I'd like to say is that um, anytime, it, it, it wouldn't matter who would be up here speaking. Anytime you'd hear somebody uh, talking about any of these subjects, one of the first things that we would have to acknowledge and recognize is that nobody comes to you to present the things that I'm going to present to you without coming from a particular, um, what we would call, plausibility structure. For you sociologists in the room, you would, this, this notion that we all grow up understanding tacitly, right, kind of non-consciously, the fancy schmancy psychiatric term, non like tacitly, we, we live in a story that we are navigating whether we know it or not. And it's in the context of that story that we come to develop an understanding not just of what we know, but how we know things. And one of the first things that's important to know is that nobody ever comes to know things in a vacuum. Right? Um, we've learned this in the last 100 years. And uh, post-modernity has taught us that like everybody has an influence that's informing what it is that they're talking about at any given time. And so it would be important to know that anytime you were listening to anybody talk here, that they're going to be talking to you from a particular perspective. And that perspective may or may not actually be grounded in what's actually true. But it's important, I think, for everybody to at least know that I'm acknowledging to you what that perspective is. So I'm going to let you know like, my plausibility structure is one that believes in a particular story. And one of the questions that we ask patients all the time, and when it gets to the question of mental health, one of the most important questions that's for people to answer is this. In what story do you believe you're living? In what story do you believe you're living? Now, here's the thing. Everybody is living, believing we live in some story. It's just that most of us aren't paying any attention to that. Most of us are living on autopilot, not asking questions of depth that if we were to would reveal some things about us that we didn't know we didn't know. And so the first question is, in what story do we believe we're living? Here's the story that I think that we're living in. I would say that I have come to believe, given the community in which I was raised and grew up in and how my life has been formed, I have come to believe that we live in a world that was formed by a God who is wildly crazy in love with his humanity. That's what I think. And that has implications. It's not just about like how we got here. Like, it's not just about the mechanics of how we were made and how long it took for the earth to get here and how long it took for us to get here, how we got here, but it's just that we are here. And then the question is, what do we do with that? And in the context of my story, we would also say, the story that I think that we live in, this Chris Christian story, that we live in a world that feels pretty broken. So at one level, we would say, like, gosh, I don't know, like, I don't know if there's anybody here who would say that they don't yearn for a world of goodness and beauty. No matter what our story is, I don't know, I don't many people wake up and say, like, gosh, I hope by the end of the day my life sucks more than it does now. <laughs> I don't know, but if those people, if they're coming to see me, right? Those people are coming to see me, right? Because that's just weird. <laughs> but 
but we long for a world of goodness and beauty. And at the same time, like I'm like deeply aware that like uh, we don't have that. Would that be fair to say? Like, like we look around, like there's just lots of stuff about the world that would seem to indicate that the world of goodness and beauty that we really want is not right immediately at our fingertips. There's lots of things about the world that we live in that's just really difficult for us to manage and discover and certainly like make happen. And so those of us who are believers also believe that at a particular time in history, a particular person emerged on the earth. His name was Jesus. And we do believe in an event, his death, his resurrection, that changed everything. It was a pivotal point in history. No matter how long this earth is around, like that's a pivotal point in history. And we also believe that in the resurrection of Jesus, that God is in the business of renewing everything. And that we who are willing to consider that God is this crazy in love with us begin to see everything and everyone as people and things to be loved until the new heaven and new earth shows up. Now that's like Christian theology in like three minutes. Now that doesn't, and, that, and I'm just saying, like I'm saying, like that's where that's what I believe. And so as I now talk about what what, what I do and what I think about human flourishing, what I think about mental health and all these kinds of things. Just so you know, like that's coming out of that context. Someone else would talk about these things and come out of a different context, but they'd have to let you know where that context is. So in my work, we would say that um, if it's true, regardless of what story you believe you're living in, regardless of that, if it's true that you come to see me as a psychiatrist, who like, well, and in our practice, we treat all kinds of conditions. We treat depression, we treat anxiety, we treat bipolar disorder, we treat schizophrenia, we treat marital problems, we treat people who like cheer for the University of Michigan, we treat all kinds of problems. Some are more serious than others. But when people are coming to us, they're not just coming to name their problems, they're also coming hoping to God that life can be better than where it is. And so we want to ask the question not just what is wrong with your situation. We don't just want to answer the question, what's the problem? We would like to be able to somehow answer the question, what does your life look like if it's flourishing? Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, medical school and in residency, here's an interesting thing. Uh, in all of my time, eight years, in all of that time, I did not, was not provided a single course <coughs> in, not a lecture, in mental health. <coughs> You're like, dude. And you're like board certified. <laughs> yeah, so they let like they let people like me in. So here's here's the thing, like if if we, we've done these like kind of these random polls with people with you know mental health and this isn't just about, about for, for medical personnel, but this is for people who are LCSWs and PhDs and so forth. Because the question of what is mental health is often not asked. And that's because we're really good at pathologizing things. We understand a great deal of things through the lens of pathology. But it's hard for us to answer the question, what is mental health? The field of interpersonal neurobiology actually seeks to answer that question. And it goes something like this. First of all, interpersonal neurobiology is a field that emerged about 15 years ago under the leadership of a guy by the name of Dan Siegel, who's a psychiatrist on the West Coast. And it is a field that really seeks to look at the intersection between, putting it just quite straightforward, between what's going on from a neurophysiological <laughs> perspective and relationships. How do the brain and relationships intersect with each other? And how might we describe and understand what it means like when the brain and relationships are flourishing maximally? And so if we were to look at all the different groups of people who study and who have a stake in the notion of the mind, right? I mean, like, if, right, like, if you don't have a course in the mind, It'd be, it'd be like going to see an orthopedic surgeon, and they've never like actually worked with the skeleton. That would be strange, right? That would be, that would be concerning. So if you haven't had a course in the mind, we'd like to know that, gosh, if that's what I do, we'd like to know that I actually have some idea about what the mind is that we're working with. And so interpersonal neurobiology would describe the mind like this. We would say that the mind is an embodied and relational process that emerges from within and between brains whose task it is to regulate the flow of energy and information. You got that? Yeah. Yeah. Lying to me. <laughs> the mind is an embodied and relational process 
that emerges from within and between brains whose task it is to regulate the flow of energy and information. Now, we could spend an hour just unpacking that, but what I want to say <coughs> is this, that we'll say just briefly, like, so the mind is not just my brain, right? Because uh, how do you know that you're anxious? <coughs> you know that you're anxious when your heart rate goes up and your palms are sweaty because your body has to tell you things. But we also know that your mind isn't just your body because we know that when you're born, newborns come into the world with about 30% of their neural activity intact and ready to go. About 70 to 80% of their neural activity, if it's gonna reach maturity, requires the interaction with another human relationship in order for that to happen. This leads to, of course, the work around research and attachment for those of you who might be familiar with that, and how attachment shapes the way your neural networks are gonna to come together and fire. Relationships are shaping your brain activity, they're shaping your relationships all day, every day, even when you're asleep. And so, the mind then becomes this relational, embodied exchange, but what does flourishing look like? And we'd say flourishing looks like this. If you look at any system, any system at all, not just living systems, but non-living systems that are flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable, which are five pretty good words that would describe systems that we think are working pretty well. Those systems demonstrate at least two qualities. The first quality is that each of the subparts of these systems are what we would call well differentiated. If you have an orchestra, you want to see, you see a symphony? The symphony has, we'll say, four different parts, right? You've got your woodwinds, your strings, your brass, your percussion. And we'd like to know that each of these different systems are well differentiated, like each of these know their parts really well, right? But we'd also like to know that not only are they differentiated, but they are linked effectively to each other. They're linked effectively to each other. And what that means is that they're gonna know that sometimes the percussion gets to play, sometimes the strings get to play. They're gonna have to play paying attention to each other, and they need a conductor for that. And we would say that in our brains, we have all these different parts of the symphony, and we need a prefrontal cortex in order for those parts to come together, for them to be both well differentiated and well linked. And those systems that flourish, those systems that are integrated, are systems that are effectively differentiated and linked. But here's the thing with human beings. I'd like to believe that I can do all these things by myself. I'd like to believe that I can go from birth to age 56, where I am now, and I can accomplish all the things that I need to accomplish by myself. In fact, we live in a culture that would lead you to believe that that, in fact, is what you've been doing. And it's not true, because your brain can't do it by itself. And so we would say that in order for my prefrontal cortex really to develop effectively, it needs the presence of other people's cortexes as well that are also trying to do the very same work. And so mental health, in fact, is not the absence of pathology. It's the presence of effectively differentiated and linked systems. And for human brains, human minds, it means that I am only going to be as effectively integrated myself as I am integrated with you. I need interaction with you in order for my mind to effectively become what I want it to be. So when we ask the question, what does it mean for when people are depressed and people are anxious and all these kinds of things, we would then take a look at, well, to what degree are they not very well differentiated? To what degree are they not very well linked? Not just within the activity of their own minds, but between themselves and other people. What does this have to do with Christian faith? Well, the first thing I would say is this. If you look early in the biblical text, we see that... God says, let us make mankind in our image. This notion that we were not ever made or designed to live as strict individuals. We were made to live in community. And what do you know? The neurobiology would suggest that that's how we have to actually function or express the flourish. But we read Oswire, where it's like, God's like, it's actually not, it's, all, it's not good for man to be alone. There's nothing like isolation to make it more likely for you to show up in my office. Now, I'm happy to take your money, because psychiatrists are happy to take anybody's money. But that's not really what I want for your life. 
Furthermore, we would say that if, right, if, as Tolstoy said, we were created for joy. Life at its best is not going to be just about me doing whatever I can to not be anxious, to not be depressed, but what I can to live in a context of a deeply connected community that enables me not just to flourish, but enables us to flourish, so that each of us as individuals are able to do that. And we would say, those of us who follow Jesus, we would say that that really is the mission of what it means for us to be human beings, to live in the image of God, who could not be more de be more delighted that we're here. And I'm going to stop with that. That gives us a little flavor about what we, what I mean when we talk about mental flourishing, emotional flourishing. And I think we can kind of head into Q&A and we can answer more questions. All right, so on my behalf, I'm Elizabeth Hayden, and uh, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Kurt, for um, giving that new perspective. Um, going to medical school, I never thought about um, mental health. And the reason I never took psychiatry is because I couldn't deal with mental disorders. Um, but just understanding what mental health really means and the way you're trying to define that is really helpful. So um, could you repeat that sentence where you said, what exactly is mental health and how there's an integration of the lobes of the brain and there's flow of energy? Could you just repeat that for us? Um. So we, we talk about this notion that um, this, this word integration um, is a word that reflects the coming together of lots of disparate parts, like our symphony metaphor that works. And um, so let's say, um, let's say that you grew up in a house where, uh, and, 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 and so I, I'm, I'm guessing in a, in a room this size, I, somebody has grown up in this kind of a house, where you grew up in a house where now, I don't know, if in Ohio, there's like, when, when, when kids are sent home from the hospital, there's like one parenting tool that we send home. And it, and it goes something like this. If you don't stop here crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard that phrase? Is that like a Midwest thing? Like, is it, is, like do they do that in Minnesota? I don't, I don't know. Right. So this is a phrase that I would hear in my house. So, if, uh, so imagine growing up in a house where um, the whole notion of, emotional expression is not something that you get the opportunity to do very much. So there's a challenge because like just because you don't allow yourself to pay attention to your emotional state doesn't mean that your brain isn't experiencing it. But that means that you can end up finding, and we're going to find all kinds of ways to cope with the whole range of emotional state that I experienced growing up. But if I'm not paying attention to it, it means I don't name it. And if I don't name it, it means there's a part of my brain that I literally have cut off from the other parts of my brain, while I'm at the same time having to manage that emotional energy, right? So it's kind of like, you know, if you, if I were to say like, look, could you pick up this five gallon bucket of water? It wouldn't be hard for you to do that. I said, good, because we're going on a five mile hike and I want you, now that I see that you can lift this, I just want you to bring it along for us, right? <laughs> and you'd be like a hundred yards into it and you're pouring the water on me because like, you're just not having this. But this is what happens, for instance, if a particular part of my mind's activity Right, the emotional domain of that activity is not given proper attention. At some point, my brain is going to run out of gas because I've been working really, really hard living in this family where we're doing everything we can to make sure that we don't piss people off, we don't make people anxious. Not that anybody here would ever grow up in a family like that, right? <laughs> so we're not doing any of these kinds of things. The whole time, I'm working really hard to contain this, even though. I'm not even a bless you. I even though I'm not even a it's about paying attention. I'm not even aware that I'm doing this. So imagine how much energy you burn regulating all of that that is now not available to you to study at med school. That's a lot of energy that is not available to you because you've grown up in a place where for you, the string section doesn't get to play. It doesn't get any attention. We're playing with other parts, right? You grow up, you think the right thing, you behave the right way, and so forth and so on. We don't talk about emotion. Or the opposite. You grew up in a family where like emotion is everywhere and it's chaotic. 
Again, not that anyone here would have these experiences, right? And now you find yourself like being aware that like emotion of any kind is like touching the third rail because it's hard to know what to do with this. And what do you know? Like you're you all are like of, of marrying age. Like so, then you marry somebody, right? And they're like they're they're emotional, and like you're like, what have I done? <laughs> I'm in love with a crazy person, right? <laughs> so all that is to say is that there are a range of different ways in which we can end up ignoring important functional aspects of the mind's activity, what we sense, what we image, what we feel, what we think, what we do behaviorally. We can either ignore those, or those things are just given free reign to behave however they will, in such a way that my mind is not given the opportunity to integrate, if that makes sense. You throw in the notion of trauma, and you have yet one more variable that muddies the water a great deal. I wrote a second book, um, this, the second book on shame, and um, you know we would say, like for instance, uh, shame as a fairly common human experience uh, I don't know when you would think that it begins. How how, early, how how young do you think you are when you, when your shame starts? How how young? Two. 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 Right. Fifteen months of age. Right. Which means you're experiencing it long before you ever have language. You're experiencing it as a felt neurophysiologic event, and its effect literally is to disintegrate the function of the mind. Now these are just things with just those kind of common everyday things that happen in homes. You add to this the severity of traumatic events, sexual abuse, harshness, neglect, and what we find is that we are giving our mind this responsibility to somehow have to manage all of this affect in ways that it is not able to do, not just because it hasn't been trained to know how to do it, but because, be, because in its isolation it doesn't have your mind to help me do it. And so it's kind of like this double indemnity, if you will, that puts my mind at risk, not just because of things that happened to me, but because in the process I'm also <coughs> cut off from other people in a way that would help me undo that. That's long-winded. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you for that long answer. Um, no shame, the right thing. <laughs> I think yeah, it brings I'm so us, glad that you're asking these questions. <laughs> it just brings me to the point that, wow, we are going, to, I thought the heart beats and, you know, the lungs breathe and, like, lots of organs do different things, but really the mind, um, but to hear you talk about how important it is for the mind to be raised in an environment that has the opportunity to vent, to be influenced, to express itself. Um, and unfortunately, we meet people in, in states of distress when um, they're going through anxiety or they're going through depression. And I think to speak to our audience here from the University of Minnesota, um, 2018 was a tough year. Um, there, is, there was a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression that was diagnosed amongst uh, the U of M students, uh, and we know of two instances of uh, suicide as well that happened. So um, knowing that we're on this journey of life, and um, how do we as a community, as a student body, be sensitive to what might be going on with one of our colleagues or co-students. And I would like you to give your thoughts at a horizontal level in the sense of student to student and also you know, perhaps faculty to student. Um, how, how can we recognize, how can we be present? Then if I can add a second question, uh, more and more online classes are in vogue, not only, you know, at the U, but all across the country and across the world. Uh, gone are the days where 
We used to sit in a classroom. We used to laugh, talk, get into trouble. Um, but that created a sense of community and an opportunity for being known as well. Like, I know we can go back to our classmates and, you know, there's a group of us who are still in touch and we kind of know <coughs> each other so well. But with this online forum, that opportunity gets lost. So um, I think technology is taking us forward. Would you have thoughts as to how we could use technology to our advantage and overcome this handicap? So how many questions are there here? <laughs> <laughs> You're all done. Right, right. So um, let me ask this: uh, How many here, uh, on any kind of on any kind of regular basis, would say you um, like nudge close to feeling overwhelmed? Good, really small percentage. Of you. <laughs> so so here so here's one thing just to say: like if um, we uh, we can't give people what we don't have, so. We, we live in a world that increasingly, um, uh, again, tacitly, and as I said, uh, we all, like, we, we create stories that we believe that we're living in, whether we're paying attention to it or not. And one of the main themes of the story that uh, we would say that our culture creates is how significant and important it is for us to be productive. Right, for us to be able to get you know, good grades. They don't even have to be straight A's, but like, it'd be preferable with straight A's, right? But like, we want to get good grades, we want to perform well. And there's certainly uh, nobility in performing well, in doing the kinds of things that we, because we're here to learn, that we, we want to become not just proficient, we, really, we want to become really, really effective at what we do. But as we, um, as, I, as, a, as a believer, um, one of the things I say is that, and I don't know how many of you believe in evil, but like I believe that evil is the second smartest force on the planet. And um, we, I like to say that evil does its best work in the middle of good work being done. It waits for you to start to do something good, and then it will join the parade. How many of us like start to do something good? How many would say that going to med school is a good thing to do? Wow, very good. <laughs> <laughs> We're all here. That's so so, right. so, like, we would say, okay, going to med school, oh, I thought it was going to be a good thing to do, but then I got here, and now I'm not so sure. So, I, 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 it's a good thing to do. And then the minute that you get here, like, you're anxious. Because, like, we're going to get overwhelmed, we're not going to do it. Right, so you're doing a good thing, and then we start to get anxious about the thing we're doing, like, that we're not doing well. And then I've got to manage all that anxiety. Because I need to perform well. Like as we say, you know, in, in Northern Virginia, you know, people, you know, parents, families in Northern Virginia, we don't worry about our kids are going to go to college or get into college. We worry that our kids aren't going to go to Yale. <coughs> and we like to say, like, they're not going to Yale because, like, how many people, like, apply that don't get in, that are qualified, all these kinds of things. All that is to say is that we do feel this sense of urgency to perform. And here's the thing. If I'm feeling overwhelmed with my own life, it's very, very difficult for me to pay attention to yours. So... We collectively grow in our anxiety. Anxiety tends to um, grow geometrically. If you're anxious and you're around somebody else who's anxious, your anxiety does not just double. It gets far bigger than that. And so if I'm less anxious than you and I happen to notice that you're having more trouble than I am, then I might, I might notice that. But then what do I do about that? Um, the whole notion of how hard we're working to be perfect uh, is as old as what we would say is the third chapter of Genesis. It's as old as St. Paul. This whole notion that I'm going to work really hard to demonstrate and prove that I'm acceptable, that I've done what I need to do to be acceptable to you and to everybody else. And what's difficult about that is that, uh, like, that's just saying that's not happening. Like, you're not going to get to a place where you're perfect. Part of life is about living um, being okay with not being okay. But here's the thing, like I can't do that if I'm not known deeply by other people who can remind me that this is true. Because very quickly, if I'm isolated in my own brain and I get that first C of my exam, then I'm worried and I've got to figure out how to do this. Now we say, yes, we'll go to study help. We'll get these guys, we'll get help with these things, surely. But I have to get this stuff done and if I don't get this done, like we, we feel the pressure, you know that, right? 
This is your brain trying to send you a message. That it doesn't just need more information, it needs more connection. Flourishing is not about being smarter. I, I travel, I, I, I've, I've had the privilege to travel all over the world doing trainings with, with folks. And I tell people, like, look, at the end of a day, two days a week, you're not going to be that much smarter. Because my job is not to make you smarter. My job is to inspire you to go home to do the work. But the work that we're talking about here is while we were doing the hard work of acquiring information, are we equally committed to doing the hard work of formation? As a human being, I will tell you, whether you believe, I mean, no matter what narrative you believe we're living in, the world or the, your narrative is forming you. It is forming how you sense, image, feel, think, and behave. And it's forming you to be either moving toward people or moving to away from people. And to the degree that we are being formed in a more integrated <coughs> way, we are more likely to be resilient in such a way that when we are with people that we do notice who are not doing well, we don't just say, hey, I think you should see somebody. But we are going to be able to take the time to be present with them. Um, we're going to flourish mostly because we're being committed to being in relationships by whom we are going to be so deeply known. So I, I, um, for the last 25 years, I, every Tuesday morning, I meet with these two other guys for prayer and confession. And I would say, like, there's nothing about my life that they don't know. Like, nothing. Uh, how many of us here in the room, if I were to poll, if you could give me the names of three people, who, if I were to ask them, collectively, they could tell me everything there is to know about you. And I don't just mean your vital statistics. I mean, they would know what your biggest fears are. They would know your deepest worries. They would know your deepest longings. Like, there was nothing about you that they don't know. What would it be like to be in a space in life where no matter how effective or ineffective I happen to be, I have people in my life who know me and they don't, like, they won't leave the room, except for one of us right here. <laughs> no shame You'd be like, oh my gosh, like the psychiatrist, like who wants to be this guy? Like this guy's patient, like he's like ruthless with people. <laughs> Only the ones who leave when we're talking. So. This notion of our, of, of the intentionality of, like, like, here's the thing, if we are not as intentional about being connected deeply with people as we are about knowing our physiology, about knowing our biochemistry, life's going to turn out to be very different for us. As far as technology is concerned, I'll say this. Um, one thing I, like we tell people is that technology is always doing two things simultaneously. From the invention of the wheel. Technology is always, first, making life more convenient, and two, making it more likely for us to be less connected. And human beings, by and large, tend to opt for making life really much more convenient and opting to use the technology, not by intention, but just by behavior, in such a way that we become less and less connected. And so with that less with that decreased connection, our brains are aware that they have to shoulder the load of emotional distress that we're collecting every day all by themselves. And that is going to make it more difficult for us as any individual to be integrated in that way. I'm not a Luddite. I don't, I'm not, it's not that the technology is a bad thing, but it is to say this. If we're not responsible with it, it will take us farther apart from each other whether we want it to or not. And I will tell you this, like, here's the other thing. Like, when you get on your, whatever your, whatever your screen is that you're looking at, like, there are reasons why we would say, you need to turn your screen off two hours before you plan to go to bed at night. As if, right? <laughs> but it's important to do this. But when you're looking at your screen, you notice that, right, that people have designed what you're looking at to intentionally distract you. We are less, look, War and Peace, you're thinking, like, where's he going with this? War and Peace would never be published today. Because there aren't enough people who would sit and read a 1,200 page novel. They wouldn't read it. Because we have such a hard time concentrating. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> well, that was very good. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we time and again see people who, uh, who call themselves private. And you know, you see them, they could be your colleagues, they could be 
um, your friends, and not everybody is really comfortable being in a space where there is two or three other people who know them that intimately. Um, and I think for those who have faith, they'd say, well, I, I'd rather sit before God and let God know me as deeply as that than share that information with another human being. Yeah. So, um, and everybody is, has different temperaments, has different comfort level. How would you uh, speak to those who may not be comfortable being in such a intimate space with another person? It's a great question. So I, I, there would be um, a, a two, two uh, things I'd, I'd reflect on. Um, one is um, just the, uh, the creation and, and cosmology. And the second would be um, the research on attachment. Um, one of the things we learn about, um, if, if, you, if you look at the macro system of cosmology, uh, and we'll just like look at our uh, like at our solar system, right? There is a certain rhythm that happens, right? We go around in the Earth, we go around the Sun once a year, at least that's what they tell me. I don't know if we go around. Like, I just know there's this big ball that like shows up in the east. It goes like who knows what that really is that's going on? But they around the Earth, right? The Earth around the Sun, right? And the Earth spins on its axis every 24 hours, right? There's a rhythm to this. And then what do you know? You look at the Earth and there are seasonal rhythms. And then you look at oceans and land, and there are tidal rhythms. And then there are even micro rhythms, right? There are waves that hit the beach. And then you get to like migration patterns. There are rhythms. We come and we go, we come and we go. And then you get to human beings, right? And there's so much about everything that who we are that is rhythmic. Isn't that, I just find this to be like, it's just fascinating to me. Like, we have a pulmonary system that is rhythmic. We inhale and we exhale. We have a cardiac system, right? It is, we have systole, we have diastole. We still have that, right? right. <laughs> I've been, it's been a while since I've been <laughs> Right? We have these, you know, you have a blink rate in your eye. It's rhythmic, every rhythm. Human beings, in terms of our relationality, we then also live rhythmically from the moment your mother starts to give birth to you, right? Um, labor pains come, and they start to push, and they wait, and they push, and they wait. There's a rhythm. You wait. And finally, like, something happens, and this baby comes into the world, and like we say, every baby comes into the world looking for someone looking for her, looking for someone looking for him, and it never stops. You're going to be dying at age 89 and still looking for someone looking for you. But if you look then at a tax, right? So we have this kind of like cosmological right down to our very biology, this rhythm thing that's going on like all over the place. And then when it comes to attachment, like after birth, it just like keeps going because there are these images. They want to come. They're with you, with you, with you. And then at some point, they start to move away. Right? Anybody here have children? Right? And did you leave them at home tonight? Anybody leave them at home tonight? Like, thanks be to God, right? Leave <laughs> them where they are. But they, they are with you, and then they leave. And they go, like, find the begonias, right? And then they find the next thing, and then they find the brunette in geometry class, right? And they take all these great... It's, it's true. Uh, you probably were the brunette that he found in geometry, right? There are these things, right? right? That, that it's just this rhythmic thing. And so, I know this is like, you're like, will you please get to the answer? <laughs> Here's the thing. Human beings flourish. So as part of, a, just again, using this symphony metaphor, right, it'd be kind of a bummer if you were listening to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony and all you heard was the same thing at the same decibel level the whole time. But you don't. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. Human beings were made for solitude. And by solitude, I don't mean isolation. I mean, we were made to be able to be with ourselves, just like that toddler is going off to be with herself. But then he comes back. Because he's got this secure base 
that enables him to run off and then do the next thing. And then he goes off a little farther and off a little farther. And then he's going off to college. Then he's going off and having his own life. But never without coming back to a secure base in some way, shape, or form. Now, we have different cardiac rhythms, right? Some people here are going to sit here sitting at a normal, like, resting heart rate of, like, 70. Others are sitting at, like, like 53. And others are at, like, 83. I mean, like, this resting heart rate, right? It's different. But, like, there's no question that you all have systole and diastole. There's no question that we need solitude in order for us to then move back rhythmically into community. In order for us to move back then into solitude, right? We need time where we can study by ourselves. And then we need time where we can come back together as a group to like, to like have common conversation about like what it is that we're studying. But that metaphor is true for any endeavor that we're doing. And we would say that flourishing is not something that we understand like, well, I'm just not, like, I'm just not a people person. Well, then, like, you should, like, move to some island in the middle of the Pacific and just, just stay there, right? And that's, uh, like, to say I'm not a people person, like, it's not that I am or I'm not. It really is about, like, well, what is going to be my cadence? What is going to be the degree to which I'm with people or not with people? But I will tell you that at the end of the day, the question is going to be, if you were really maximally able to both be in this rhythm of solitude and community, in which you're deeply known in community so that you can then go do your work as an individual, is your life going to be better than it is now with you not being a people person? And we would say that for those folks who have challenges being with people, revealing who they are, we'd say that probably didn't begin six weeks ago. <laughs> we would probably say if we were to give you the adult attachment interview and we get a sense of what your attachment pattern looks like, we'd see probably pretty quickly that in no small way, what it was like growing up in your house where you learned very quickly that intimacy and the presence of being seen and known by somebody else actually starts to feel uncomfortable because in those relationships, being seen was dangerous. Because you grew up in a house where what you were feeling either was disregarded or it was made fun of or it was taken advantage of. Temperament plays a large role in any of all this, but I think the general idea, you get it. That brings us to the next question is religious practices. Does <laughs> religious practices, traditions make meaningful contributions to mental health? Um, and in your specific practice, do you recommend any specific religious slash spirituality practices? And are you aware of any practices that might negatively impact the world? So again, a great question. I, I mean, I think um, it's, it's probably fair to say um, that each one of us, if we, if, 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 we were to ask, if we were to poll the audience, and you, you said religious practice, everybody has an image that comes to mind about like, what we mean by that, mm -hmm. right? And for some of us, like if we hear the word religious fill in the blank, like the first word, religious, you know, like you, you start to have like hives, right? <laughs> There's like, like an allergic reaction to this, this notion. Because for, for us, I mean, we, we perhaps have had some experience either directly in our own religious community or vicariously, we hear all these stories because we're well informed, right, from Facebook, um, that you know, religion is a dangerous thing. Not that I've had any experience with it myself, of course, but because, like, I'm informed. Which, of course, is a problem. Um, it's fair to say that um, no matter what religious tradition you might find yourself in or you might know people in, like, the first general rule of thumb uh, is uh, that of humility. Um, Leslie Newbigin, who's a well-known British theologian and missionary, um, uh, I, I, I found his, his work to be so helpful. You know, he said this. He said, look, um, nobody knows what the truth actually is. Nobody knows. Like, knows, like, for certain. We're not going to find out until the end of the world. That's when we're going to find out. And for those of us who follow Jesus, like, we trust that we have a sense, that we, we have a read on that. <coughs> that we, uh, do I know for certain? No. So, first of all, we'd say, like, it's not just religious practice of any kind. 
we're talking about any kind of religious practice we would hopefully want to know is, is taking place in a context of humility, first of all. We do know, though, that um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's really fashionable in the West, in the US in particular, to, um, for people to say, like, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Have we ever heard that phrase? Right? <laughs> okay, right, and I, I, don't, I, don't mean to, I, don't, I don't mean to make fun of it, but it's, but it's a fashionable phrase. And I think, so, you know, some of what we would like to say is, like, I, I, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm, I, like, I, I'm, I'm serious about spiritual things, but the whole religion thing, like, gives me the creeps, right? That's kind of like a clinical phrase. It gives me the creeps. And I get it. Like, I get it. Here's the interesting thing. There's data that looks at and uh, you know studies that look at religious practice and people who who, who talk about spirituality. Like the more uh, deeply committed you become to spiritual exploration practice and so forth, the more religiously uh, connected you tend to be. And why is that? Because at some point, my spirituality, my spirituality, my spiritual life. Um, if I'm not going to deal with people, then I can just be spiritual and not religious. But what religion does is that it forces me to actually have to put my spirituality on the line with other people. It forces me to have to answer the question, how is my spirituality going to actually uh, uh, invite me to be in a community with people whom I am actually may not like them all? <laughs> it's like being in your family, right? I'm, but I'm going to stay with these people, I'm going to love these people, and this is what happens. If you decide that you're going to be with a group of people, I don't mean that are, I don't mean people that are, are mistreating you or that are abusing you. I don't mean that. I mean like the best families in the world are screwed up, okay? We tell you, like there are two people in the world, people who, know, who are screwed up and know it, and people who are screwed up and don't know it, right? Those are two kinds of people in the world. And so if we're going to love people, it's likely that we're going to be in community with them. And people who are in community tend to do religious practices together. And so first, it's humility. The second thing is to, rec it's just to recognize, like, my brain most effectively does religious practice with other people. That's another thing. So um, for instance, uh, we run groups in our practice, and we have a meditation exercise. And for many men, there might be some of you here in the, in the room that practice meditation. It may not be religiously connected at all, but you practice meditation. And that is an effective way for you to do a whole range of things that are good for you physiologically and interpersonally and so on. And so on. But if you were to make a practice of meeting with two of your friends every morning before you go to class and say, like, we're just going to spend 10 minutes, that's all, 10 minutes doing this deep breathing exercise in the room together with everybody, it geometrically changes the exercise for everybody. Because my brain is aware that I'm not doing it by myself. So we talk about things like meditation practices. We talk about things like being in communities where you can tell the whole truth. Now, in the Christian tradition, we'd say this is about confession. But I like to remind people that in the Christian tradition, confession, to tell the truth, is not just about telling the truth about like how I'm such a screw up, like all about my sin. That's, it, you know, my sin is really about like acknowledging the part of me that regularly turns away from relationship when I'm afraid of it. That's what sin is really about. I turn away from relationship to other things to cope with my distress when I'm in the middle of being afraid of turning toward relationship. And there are dozens of ways in which I do that. So I'm going to tell the truth like this is what I do, but also telling the truth, also confessing means I'm going to tell you what I want in life. I'm going to tell you, and by want, I don't mean that selfishly. I mean like, I'm going to tell you like, I really want you to like me. Can you imagine? I'll give you this assignment before the week is over. <laughs> imagine. Find one person that you would really like them to like you. And I don't mean like like you, like you. You could do that too. <laughs> it is Valentine's Day, by the way. <laughs> My wife, she's in Hawaii. Can you oh. believe that? <laughs> yeah. You tell her. I'm going to give her your give her, you, her self. No. <laughs> What's she doing there in that beautiful place where I'm up here, where it's 30 below zero? <laughs> this this sense this sense of, if I give you the assignment to say, I want you to find someone, and I want you to tell them what you want. What is your longing? And of course, we're afraid to name the longing, because what happens if I grew up in a family where you named your longing and you just didn't get it with no explanation? 
or you asked, you, you named your longing, and you were told there was something wrong for you for even wanting it. Like, how many of us are ever given the opportunity to name what we want? So here's things I know we're probably just going over where we're not supposed to be going, but we're good. Okay. So so here's an example. Um, a, an eight-year-old, ten-year-old boy comes to his dad and says, "I would like a new baseball glove because you know spring season is coming." And in Minnesota, that'll be like in July, right? So, and so we're, 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 I'd like a new baseball glove. Now, the dad has one of a number of different responses. He could say, okay, because, you know, I'm now part of the lawnmower. You know about the lawnmower parents? You've heard about helicopter parents, right? Like, do you have them? Are they yours? Are they yours, parents? Right? They're helicopter parents, always hovering. Lawnmower parents are now, I mean, it's the new, it, like, it's the new kind of like, ma'am, I mean, like, it's a new phrase. These are parents who are out in front of their kids making sure that, like, the lawn is prepared. Like, there's nothing that, like, disturbs them, right? <laughs> Calling teachers at high school to make sure that they meet their kids to make sure they get to their classroom, right? This is a real story, right? These kinds of things are happening, right? So, now I don't remember where I was, right? <laughs> Baseball. 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 Okay, we talk about memory a lot. It's a problem. <laughs> if you say, like, you could say, like, I'm just going to give you what you want. That's one option. It may not be the most helpful option. Another option could be, um, you know, you, you just got a new glove last year. You don't need a new glove. Period. No, son, we don't have enough money for that. Like, it's logical, it's reasonable, but, like, it's right. Here's the thing. If you were to say, I'm sorry that I can't get that for you. Because uh, here's the reason why. Because you just got your, But I really want to know, why do you want a new glove? Well, because my friends are getting it. Okay, yeah. And why are your friends going, like, what, what do you, like, why do you think a new glove? Tell me about what's a new glove going to mean for you. And you see, if you've been talking to your kid since your kid was about three or four, you're going to have a conversation with your kid who's 10 years old, and you're going to discover with him, and he's going to discover that you know that he wants a new baseball glove because he wants to be really, really good at the game. He wants to know that that glove will help it be possible, that there will be no ball that gets through the infield. And you come to find out pretty quickly that what he wants is not just a piece of leather for his hand. He wants to be really, really good at something. And his little heart is wanting desperately, even though it doesn't know it yet. His heart wants you to recognize that and say, I know how badly you want to be good at this game. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure. We're not going to get you a glove. What else can we do to make sure that you're going to be good at this game? Because what this kid needs more than a new glove, he's asked more than asking for a new glove, he's asking to make sure that even if dad says no, dad sees his heart. This kid is asking to be seen in ways that are way beyond the physicality of what he's asking his dad to buy for him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. This is what it means to be in a community where you can name what you want. And even if you can't have it for good, reasonable reasons, you're in a community that can acknowledge that that you want it is totally legit. Because if I'm able to name those things, it means I'm actually able to name lots of things that I want. And even if I don't get them all, I practice naming what I want. And before long, I'm naming all kinds of other things that I want that I may actually get to have, including my new research grant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding, right? If you grew up in a house where you learn, like, if you ask for things that you want and you're not going to get them, you learn pretty quickly, like, well, I could never get the research grant because, like, I mean, because this is how my brain gets wired. So. We're talking about practices, for instance, in which you say, like, I want you to be in a community where you're naming regularly what it is that you long for. There are gratitude practices, for instance. Now, gratitude practices don't necessarily emerge explicitly out of religious communities. They don't have to, because it's, because, like, as it turns out, even though, like, that's where they actually emerged originally, <laughs> now the science tends to show, gosh, what happens when you practice gratitude? If we say, like, here, so here's that. Anybody here buy groceries? <laughs> or you just like order from Amazon. <laughs> okay, so here's here like here's an exercise. Like this, 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 this. right. Okay, here we go. If you buy groceries, do you buy groceries at the same store? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you buy them at the same store, and you know some of the people that you're like that you get familiar with your people that work at the store, 
here's your assignment. The next time you buy groceries, if it's not too far away from you, like if it's not like, like a four day walk to get there, <laughs> two or three days later, I want you to go back to the store and I want you to find a person that, you rec that helped check out your groceries and you walk up to them and you say, like, I just want to let you know, I'm really grateful for the work that you did for me two days ago, bagging my groceries. And here's what's going to happen. First, like, they're going to they're gonna, like, look for the button that they push when, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, they will, right? Like, the manager's going to come, right? And this is, the, this is what makes it so cool, because the manager's going to come and you're going to turn to the manager you're going to say, like, do you know what kind of employee you have here? I'm so grateful for the work that they did. Here's the thing. We would think this is totally weird because we never do it. We don't practice gratitude at this level. Do you know what it's like to be remembered when you just live a life in which you assume you're being forgotten on a routine basis? You know what it's like for your brain to wake up to the notice that somebody remembered that you bagged their groceries two days ago and now they're back at your Safeway or wherever it is that's here and they're telling you thank you for what you did? We have this um, exercise uh, when we work with couples um, in which we, uh, it, it, it's a similar gratitude exercise. And of course, these are couples who typically, if they're seeing us, like they're not happy with each other. That's why they're coming to see me. And um, we say, so uh, here's your, uh, your assignment is for the next uh, seven days, before you come back again next week, the next seven days, I want you to find one thing that fits that is measurable that you can express your gratitude for with your spouse. I want you to name it, I want you to And you can't just like be coming in the front door from work and say, hey honey, hey, thanks for coming to the meal. I feel like, no, no, that doesn't get it. Like, I want you to sit, I want you to take two minutes and I want you to look them in the eye and I was like, here's what you did and this is what I'm really, really grateful for. Okay, now when you first give uh, couples this assignment, like, they're really not very happy with me <laughs> because they know that it's forced, it feels mechanical, it feels like there's nothing really real about this. We're having to do this because Kurt's asking us to do it. They come back seven days later, and here's what they report consistently. By about day four or five, they will report that they are already waiting and anticipating for when their spouse is going to say to them what it is that their spouse is grateful for. Because we start to experience what it feels like to have someone look us in the eye and express that gratitude. What they thought was going to be so mechanical becomes transformational. Because somebody with intention, with the amount of time that it takes to take in the gratitude, is having their brain changed and their life renewed along the way. By the way, um, we like to say like it, it takes uh, the experience of shame neurophysiologically. It takes the experience of shame to be encountered less than three seconds, right? Somewhere between two and three seconds. If something happens for your neurophysiologic system to take on the full weight of what it is, no matter how small or big the moment of humiliation is, it could be a very small thing, right? I mean, you're you know you're you're at a party and you're talking and you offer something with two or three other people standing and they just kind of like blow by it. They don't they ignore you. You know how good that feels, right? It takes less than three seconds for you to feel that. Um, it takes somewhere between 30 to 90 seconds for you to receive and hold compliment. So here's what we do. Here's part of, here's another exercise that we give people. I don't know if this religious practices or not, right? Here's, here's one of the things that we do though. We say, look, um, when someone pays you a compliment, and this is like, I have to do this, when someone pays you a compliment, I want you to pause them. So say, hey, thank you so much for dropping me off. And you're like, okay, can we just wait for a second? And you're like, what? <laughs> and I just want to let you know, like, I just want to take that in. And they're like, oh, you, like, you've been to this Thompson thing, haven't you? Like, this is <laughs> I say, like, no, I, I want to just simply take in that you have paid me a compliment or that you have thanked me. Because what you're taking in is not this abstract thing we call a compliment. You are taking in their eye contact. You're taking in their tone of voice. You are allowing yourself, literally, to remember, to encode the moment. 
And the brain is really good at efficiently watching for danger. So it no wonder like we're good at sensing shame because like it's so nauseating. Like we notice it, we like we turn away from it quickly. But to hear love directed at me and to take it in takes a much greater time frame. So when we give people these practices, they find that the felt sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts that are related to this act of gratitude or expression of compliment becomes an embodied reality for them. When these are things that are done on purpose in community, they are geometrically reinforced. I'll stop with that. OK, uh, thank you, Kirk, for, for those answers. I think I'm getting the cue here that it's time to move to Q&A. Um, I have a request. The, this, mic will, this mic will come along. Um, those of you who want to raise a question, please be brief, civil, and ask a question in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> and wait for the mic to be in your hand before you start speaking. <laughs> I don't think I really need the microphone. Um, oh, I'm sorry. My question is this. How does your paradigm apply to treatment of specific groups? I mean, it strikes me that you're talking about a fairly biased sample of individuals you work with. And I'm wondering if you've worked with other specific kind of groups and how you apply the paradigm to treatment of those groups. Yeah, and by groups you mean what? I might be waiting. Say sex offenders. Right. So. Um, One of the things that we that we like to talk about a, a fair bit is that um, uh, neurons will change one. Uh, they 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 will they they can change about a millimeter per month. They can grow a millimeter per month in most um, settings. So when you're working with pe with people who have fairly fixed neurobiological experience. So whether it's sex offenders, whether something's you know really difficult, let's say psychopaths. Well, right. So um, there are some folks who I, I mean, most psychopaths I would say would probably not find themselves in my office. So in some respects, we would say, um, like all physicians, right? You can take a you you can you can bring a person into your office and you can say, I think you need to have your gallbladder removed, and they can say, like, I'm not doing it. Like you can't make it happen. The, any clinician, psychiatry or otherwise, is always working along this line of I have things that I can offer, and the patient is going to have to be able to like be involved in that in some way, shape, or form. Now the thing is this: like I can have a patient who is willing and who wants to have their gallbladder taken out, but like they're scared to death to get on the OR on the table. Hard to do that. And so we're going to do everything we possibly can to create optimum conditions for them to make those kinds of changes. But sometimes you're working with all kinds of underpinnings, neurobiological, genetic, so forth and so on, that make it pretty difficult for that to happen. I mean, when we work with patients with schizophrenia, for instance, you're like working with folks that, um, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have been familiar with or know people with schizophrenia. But it is, right, so it, one, of the, one of the challenges is that people with this particular experience in life, you know, don't necessarily think they have a problem. I don't mean like cross the board, but it's hard for them. They don't understand the nature of their experience in the same way that everybody else around them does. If you were to talk to a person who has schizophrenia and then talk to their family, who are the people that are most worried? It's typically not the patient. And so... What we say is like we will work with the patient, we will work with the people who are able and ready to work with those, things, right? So a lot of times, a lot of the work that we end up doing is going to be with those folks who are more indirectly related to that, who are able to take that off. I don't know if that's helpful or not. It just, it just strikes me that it, it's a model that doesn't apply to certain sets of people. The concept does, but in terms of actual treatment efficacy, it would seem to me it'd be a tough draw. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I'd love to have more conversation about it because I think that um, I, I think in, in some respects the whole notion of integration 
Um, I, I, I haven't really encountered anything that, that, that for which it's not a helpful way for us to understand like what's actually happening in the it's situation. It's your orthogonality issue. I mean, I'm sorry? It's your orthogonality issue. I mean, you're trying to blend these two competing issues of faith, essentially, and psychology and some measure of personal integration. Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I think, too, for me, that's, that's the thing, right? It gets back to this whole notion of, of anthropology. I mean, I'm, and for me, I, like, it, I, I don't tend to think in terms of, like, I have faith on one side and I have science on another side. Like I don't. That's not kind of like how that operates in my in my own kind of way of processing it. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting to listen to. Uh, there are a lot of people that I know whose goal is to be mentally healthy, and that's very. They don't define what that term is. Um, and they don't view religion as a necessary step to do it. I assume when you treat patients that are not religious, you don't bring religion in to try to get them mentally healthy. And that seems to kind of underscore the point that religion isn't necessary for mental health. Would you argue otherwise? So is everybody here the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so here's the thing. Um, I, uh, as, as I would say, like, I, I don't, I, I think, I don't think, you know, like, we, we would first probably have to define our terms, mm -hmm. right? Like, what do you mean by religion? What do you mean by that? What, what, what does anyone mean by that? And um, I think everybody, as we said, like everybody has a plausibility structure that they're working with. Everybody does. And I'm, you know, my uh, mission is to work with people within the context of the plausibility structure that they have. But for some folks, that plausibility structure includes things like, uh, I mean, like how many patients have I had who have come in and said, look, I'm depressed, I read the literature, I want this antidepressant at this dose, and I don't want to talk about my family. <laughs> okay? That's a particular plausibility structure that applies in such a way that is necessarily going to exclude certain elements of their mind's function that they necessarily, we would say, necessarily would be good for them to include as part of the conversation if they really want to flourish. Does that mean that a person has to go to a certain religious place of worship in order for them to be emotionally healthy? No, it doesn't mean that. I think the question, though, in the end, uh, becomes one of, again, getting back to the question, like, well, what do you actually want? Like, what do you want? And, you know, I, I think that there are probably, um, uh, you know, people of Christian faith, for instance, don't have... Um, don't like have a corner on the market of people who come together and know each other deeply and well and so forth and so on, right? So it's not that's that that's not a pre, that's not a prerequisite for that. Um, but I would say that that ultimately most people that I know um, at some point um, are, st are are grappling not so much with the question of religion. Of course, we have to define that, but are grappling with questions of ultimate value, right? Everybody's kind of like we, as as we like to say. Um, in, 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 uh, in our story, in the, in the Christian story, we have a word, we call it eschatology. Some of us might be familiar with that word. We talk, and it's this notion of like, what do we think is going to happen at the end of the world? And I've got, I've got good friends who believe in the cosmology that like, nothing happens at the end of the world. Like the, the, like the, the big freeze is going to happen, everything is going to go dark, all the energy is going to flatten out, there will be nothing left of anything, right, to measure. And so they're going to have to like learn to live in that particular story, and and they're going to have to like decide like how are they going to live in that story, and I my job is like not to try to like you know in any way shape or form like bully them into thinking about it, that they're living in a different story, but I am going to ask them questions about like are they deeply known in their community? I am going to ask them all these things about are they you know what, what's happening in the integration process of their life? So regardless of where, how we find ourselves. Um, it, in regards of how we find our lives formally being shaped by whatever particular things that we do religiously, we are always kind of like living into the story that we think that we're in the middle of. And my question would be for all patients is like, well, you know, tell me about what you really, really long for and tell me about what your griefs are because that's kind of who we are as human beings. Like we are people of longing, we are people of grief. And into that synaptic cleft, we would say relationships become the thing that really help shape that most powerfully. And I would want to know from them, are they experiencing the kind of relational integration that they really long for? And we don't have to talk about church, we don't have to talk about Jesus, we don't have to talk about any of that kind of stuff in order for them to talk about that. 
the thing for me is that so many of them, like, they're more than happy not to talk about religion, but they haven't even begun to talk about the relational voids that are in their life, if that makes sense. So I don't, I don't like, think that, I, like, I'm not a prescriber of religion for religion's sake. What I'm really trusting is that if people are really doing the work of exploring relational integration from an interpersonal neurobiological perspective, that eventually they're going to move to a place of flourishing. And that may not include that, that may not necessarily include a religious practice. Hi. Hi. So uh, I just want to start off by saying that I really appreciate what you're saying. A lot of it really resonates with me. Uh, my question is, uh, you talked a little bit about building a narrative that supports resiliency. And I'm wondering uh, how, what elements of a narrative would you say that are important to have that? And how do I go about uh, integrating those into my life? That's a great question. I, I mean, they're all, these, these are all really, really important questions. So one of the things we talk about, about narratives in general, um, uh, is that, that human beings, as far as we know, are the only animals that we know, unless, you're, unless you read Gary Larson. Remember Gary Larson? <laughs> <laughs> Gary Larson, like, everybody's telling stories. Like, like you know, dogs, cats, chickens, everybody's telling stories. Um, but as far as we know, because they're not talking to us, human beings are the only people who tell stories. We, we narrate things. And we begin to do this pretty quickly after we start to acquire language. But there are some things that are important and helpful to know about storytelling, about us storytelling humans. And one would be this. Um, the first thing is that um, your story, your story, was being told by someone else long before you ever arrived, right? When you were conceived, when somebody found out that they were pregnant with you, they started to tell stories about you, right? So I'm, uh, I'm the fourth of four sons, but my parents in 1962, my parents found out that my mother was pregnant with me. She was 44 years old, right? And in 1962, to be pregnant at 44. I had brothers who were 18, 16, and 11 years old, right? And like my my parents' friends were saying, like Lewis, Betty, like what were you doing? Like, like, we know what you were doing, like, but, but, but you know, you know what I mean, right? But in 1962, if you're 44 and you're pregnant, you're anxious, and you have a lot of people around you in your community who are also anxious on your behalf. And that means that my story begins in such a way that I'm actually not necessarily initially wanted in the world. I'm actually a source of anxiety. And you might be, well, Kurt, like you, you, like, you didn't know. I'm really smart. No, you, you didn't know. Like, here's the thing. Like, we know that like when moms, when moms are anxious, their stress hormones affect the neurodevelopment of their fetus. So the story begins with one being anxious, right? That, that, that's an example of what I mean. Like, so, our, and, and, and we, so we come from lots of different places where our story was being told by someone else before we were born. And then you are born, and they continue to tell you your story, right? And they tell it in all kinds of ways that is not necessarily to your liking. Like, they, they put you in clothes that you would never be caught dead in now, right? Like, who here would wear a onesie? Right? Oh, you would wear a onesie? Okay. I'm going to come back and see that. I mean, not like literally see it, but I mean, you know. They, you know, but so, so they're, and they, and they call you things, and they name you things, they take you to play dates with people that you hate, and, but they, they like, you know, you're going to do these things, and your story is told by somebody else. And that also moves to the next thing about storytelling, which is that our sense of who we are, the narrative that we tell, is always a collaborative affair. Mm -hmm. We never tell our stories by ourselves. I am always telling my story with somebody in the back of my head collaborating with me. They might not even be alive, right? But they've been some influence for me. So one of the questions would be, well, who are the people that are in our lives who are helping us tell the stories that we really want to tell? So that's, so that's another element. Here's another element. Most of our stories, the, the, the most powerful parts of our stories that are told are not told using words. Because 60 to 90 percent of all human communication is nonverbal, right? We sense, we image, we feel. My brain far more easily remembers things that I sense and the image that I feel than what I think. 
right? Which is why, you know, you can watch a YouTube video of somebody drawing on a whiteboard while they're like playfully telling the story about, you know, renal function, and you'll remember it. When just reading it out of a physiologic text, physiology text will be harder to remember. So much of our stories are shaped by what we sense, what we image, and what we feel, but it's a lot of what we don't pay any attention to. How well are we paying attention to what we're paying attention to? And to what degree of what we're paying attention to has to do with what we sense, image, and feel that is blowing right by us but still shaping who we are. Another thing is that we tell stories in order for them to be heard. I don't just have a story because like that just happened to be what I do. Like I want someone else to hear me. I want to be seen. I want to be heard. I want like four-year-olds come in with their drawing, right? That looks like a four-year-old drawing, and they want to show you. They they're telling you their story, and they want you to notice this. They want their story to be seen, heard, felt. Who are the people who are helping you tell your story by listening to you well? And that becomes yet another element of storytelling, which is that the listener is as important in the storytelling process as is the speaker. Um, we see this in our group work all the time, where someone starts to tell their story, and they're really like, um, they're, they're you know they're they're telling some traumatic event and like. It, it's like they're watching paint drop, right? They're, they're telling it, and the people in the group are like a little flummoxed because they don't know why this person is telling it so blithely. And then someone else is like across the room, is like coming out of their shoes with, because they're angry on this person's behalf. And the person's like, well, like, why are you so upset? I'm upset because of what your dad did to you. And they're like, gosh, I never would have known that. But the listener now, helps this speaker tell the story more robustly, tells more of the story, right? And so even, so that's the thing, like we have all kinds of questions about these things that we can get to the answers to if we're willing to pause, take a step back, and start to actually start the conversation much sooner, much in a much more granular way, to name what we want and what I'm afraid is gonna happen if I name what I want. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you.